Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Presbyterians don't really talk about the end of times. In general, I really appreciate this about us. For one thing, much of the pop culture evangelical end times lore that we hear is biblically and theologically pretty suspect. From those self-appointed prophets predicting the day and the time, sorry, you're at Carol Camping, wrong every time, to so-called Christian movies like Left Behind, where people are raptured right out of their clothes because apparently in heaven we're naked. <laughs> It's all just a bunch of speculation and, in my humble opinion, exploitative fear-mongering. Adding to that, there are far too many versions of Christianity out there that focus on the future over the present, or more specifically, what God will do for us in the future, rather than what we can be doing for God and one another in the present. So if we Presbyterians err on the side of loving one another today over worrying about what will happen tomorrow, I'd say we're doing all right. But as we come to the end of the liturgical year, in two weeks we'll start over again with Advent, the lectionary serves us up scriptures with eschatological visions and even we Presbyterians must turn our gaze toward the future and ask, how does the story end? What does it mean to confess our faith that Christ will return? What are we doing when we pray for the kingdom to come, God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? This morning, we heard two different, very different visions of the end. The first comes from the final chapters of Isaiah. Isaiah paints a picture of Jerusalem where all of creation is restored to justice, peace, and joy. The wolf and the lamb lie down together. No one hurts or destroys one another. Children do not die in their mother's arms. The elderly live out many years in delight. Life is simple. People build houses, plant crops, and enjoy the fruits of their labor. God is there to answer even before the people cry. We've heard this vision before, right? It's the peaceable kingdom. It's a return to life as in the Garden of Eden, to the world as God first made it and perhaps intended it all along. And then... Then there's Luke, now for something completely different. In Luke's gospel, the end comes with an apocalyptic bang, or several bangs, really. There are wars and insurrections, earthquakes, plagues, and famines, oh my. The Jerusalem temple is destroyed, not a stone is left on stone. False prophets arise, one after the other, vying for allegiance. Disciples are betrayed by family and friends, and they're persecuted by political authorities. There are signs in the sun, moon, and stars. All of creation disintegrates into chaos and destruction before finally Christ comes in the clouds and descends to rule the earth. So, Who's right? How does the story end? 
What do we do with these radically different and rather unreconcilable pictures of the end of time? At different times in history, Christians have read themselves into one vision or another. In periods of relative calm, certain Christians have equated their progress and prosperity with Isaiah's peaceable kingdom. And in times of chaos and catastrophe, those of more apocalyptic stripes have pointed to crumbling human institutions as signs that the end is near. Pick your prophecy depending on your present experience. How does the story end? These two visions from Isaiah and Luke are obviously quite different. But one thing that they do share in common is that both of them were written down and circulated during times of crisis for God's people. Take Isaiah. His final chapters, the end of that book, are addressed to the Babylonian exiles who have just returned home to Jerusalem. Finally, their conquering overlords have been defeated. Finally, they can go back home and live at peace in their land. But what they come home to is a city in shambles. The walls, their homes, even their temple has been destroyed. All the infrastructure they took for granted is gone. Numbers are down, morale is low. Friends and family have died or just decided not to come back. And so Isaiah writes, be not afraid you faithful people. This disarray and lack of structure, this feeling of purposelessness, it will not last forever. God will restore your community everything that you so loved. The end is coming, and believe you me, it will be good. <laughs> Fast forward several centuries and we get to Luke. He's writing to another group of God's people in crisis, the Christians living in Jerusalem some 50 years after the death of Jesus. That peaceable kingdom of which Isaiah wrote has not come to fruition. In fact, things have gone from bad to worse. The Jewish Roman wars have just broken out, and the Romans have destroyed again that temple that Isaiah's returning exiles built. Christians and Jews are being persecuted, jailed, even executed for failing to pledge allegiance to the empire. Jesus promised that he would return, but Time's a ticking and no sign yet of the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And so Luke, as he's writing the story of Jesus, puts this prophecy on the lips of Jesus himself. Be not afraid, dear disciples. All this chaos and calamity must happen before Christ will return. These are the signs you must look for to see that the battle is almost won. The end is coming, and believe you me, it will be good. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. That's always the message, isn't it? Always what God wants to say to God's people. Visions of the end, they keep emerging from times of crisis, upheaval, and turmoil. Those times when no one can make sense of the present. 
So we look to the future for God's justice to prevail. We pray that one day, if not today, God's will will be done. We trust what the prophets tell us. Be not afraid. We know a thing or two about crisis and upheaval, <laughs> don't we? We've got wars and plagues. Yes, check to violence and division, economic and political uncertainty. And you know, maybe that helps us. Maybe it gives us a little bit of insight into what Isaiah and Luke were feeling when they, they penned these two radically different visions of the future. We know what it's like to live through turmoil. We know what it's like to not know how the story ends. So friends, I wonder if we were to write a vision of the end times out of our 2022 times of crisis and upheaval, what might it look like? Would we say, behold, the days are coming when you will find a restaurant that is open on Monday, where the bank drive through line shall take less than an hour. Behold, take heart, for you shall call on customer service, and a real human being shall answer you. <laughs> Might our prophecy be, in that day, Democrat will sit down with Republican, and no one will threaten one another. For they shall not hurt or destroy or ruin Thanksgiving dinner. Our witness might proclaim there will be wars and violence in the streets. Nations will take up arm against, arms against nations and neighbors will turn against neighbors. And the suffering, oh, it will be great. The tears of mothers and fathers will make a river through the streets for children lost far too young. Children from the Ukraine to Uvalde. Institutions and markets shall rise and fall. Politicians and Twitter CEOs shall say and do truly insane things. But when you see these things happening, <clears throat> lift up your head. Take heart, for the Lord is coming. The kingdom is almost at hand. In spite of all appearances, God holds the future. And in the end, God's love wins. God's love wins. Friends, the only thing we know is that that is how the story ends. That's what all these visions share in common, isn't it? That in the end, good triumphs over evil. Love holds out over hate. God holds the future, and God's future is good. This is how the story ends. <laughs> We don't know when and we don't know how. We don't know what the future holds. But we trust in our faith that the world, the universe, that all of history is in God's hands. And that the God of love will prevail. So friends, let us live. Live lives of love and of justice. And let us leave that future to God. For as Julian of Norwich has famously said, all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. Amen.